the blessing. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to 1 John chapter number 4. I'll be concluding a series of messages I've been preaching on Sunday mornings on the birthmarks of, a, of someone who is genuinely born again, birthmarks of a true believer. And I'm going to introduce um, uh, this morning's message real quick here and then briefly um, recap. Uh, the first three, we won't take long time explaining them, but just to remind us where we've been, and then we'll get through today's. In uh, chapter number four, and look with me in verse number 13, we'll find uh, the, the thought behind this fourth message. And the Bible says in verse 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. He has given us of his spirit. The Bible teaches us that when somebody comes to Jesus Christ as their Savior, uh, that, he, that the Holy Spirit of God immediately moves in to their heart. And he becomes their guide and their constant companion. I believe that that began in John chapter 20 when Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I believe from that moment on that when somebody gets saved, it happens at the moment of their conversion. And so I'd say this fourth characteristic of a genuine believer is that there is a spiritual companion. And that's what we're going to talk about today, but let's have a word of prayer. Father, we've opened your word. We've read it. We've read multiple passages today already. We've read corporately. We've read individually. Many here today have read before they came today uh, from the scriptures. Lord, I just pray that you would cause the word of God to come alive in our hearts. Uh, and Lord, that it might dwell in us because the Bible talks about the importance of your word dwelling in us and we dwelling in your word. And God, I pray that we would be people of the word. And God, that Christ might magnify himself through us today. Lord, I pray that we'll hold him up. And if there's anybody here who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they might, before today is over, they might trust Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, we started off on, these, on this series all from the book of 1 John. And, and the, the, the springboard, the impetus for this was 1 John 5, 13, where the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So if God wrote something specifically and said, Here, I'm writing this to you for the purpose of you knowing that you're saved. Well, that's a good place to start saying, what are some of those birthmarks? What are some of those characteristics of a genuinely born-again person? And in chapter 5, if you look there quickly, we talked about, first of all, a genuine conversion. In verse number 1, whosoever believed that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, loveth, the, uh, loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. And so we become the child of God with a genuine conversion. That there must be a point in time where you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say, well, I, I kind of grew into salvation. Listen, you might, you might have a process leading up to your salvation. But salvation is still an event. There was, a, there was a process leading up to my birth, all right? But I still have a birth day. Uh, the same thing is true. You say, well, we're, yeah, but that's, that's, that's at birth. Uh, what about adoption? Would you not agree that there's a process that leads up to adoption? But there's also a point where the papers are signed, where it becomes a legal fact. It is an event that takes place. And so those are illustrative of the fact that when somebody, there, there are many things that might lead you up to the point of trusting Christ. But when you trusted Christ, that was an event. 
And so the Bible describes it this way in, in Romans chapter 10. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when the Bible says to call upon the name of the Lord, that certainly doesn't sound like, well, you have to call on the name of the Lord over a period of years or call upon the name of the Lord over a period of months or even call upon the Lord o- over a period of weeks and you'll be saved. No, you call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Salvation the, the, is a, an event that takes place. It is a conversion and, I, and we need to have a place uh, you might you say, well, I don't remember the exact time. Well, I know, wh- I know exactly where I was. As I said four weeks ago, I could take you to within five feet of the place I was standing when the Holy Spirit of God showed me I was lost. Oh, listen, it wasn't, it wasn't some, and I believe that's the work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about it in just a few minutes, but that's the work of the Holy Spirit. When, when he showed me I was lost, it wasn't maybe it wasn't if, because the Holy Spirit of God has no interest in telling you maybe you're lost or maybe you're saved. His business is to tell a saved man he's saved so he can go on and live under perfection, in other words, completion. Or he's, his business is to tell a lost man he's lost so that he'll come to Christ. There's no circumstance where you can imagine the Holy Spirit of God saying to somebody, well, maybe you're okay or maybe you're not okay. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. His yea is yea, his nay is nay. And we are, and so listen, I can tell you from experience, it coincides with the Bible, uh, but I can tell you from experience, man, when the Holy Spirit of God tells somebody they're lost, he tells them emphatically that they're lost. And this whole transaction didn't take long, but I'm telling you, within minutes, I, I could tell you within a few uh, a few feet of the very place where I knelt and I prayed and I asked Christ to come into my heart and be my savior. I could take you to the place. It was an event. And before that, I believed I was saved. I convinced myself I was saved, but there was never any solid, hard assurance of salvation. But since that day, boy, since that day, there's never been a moment of doubt about my salvation. Not a moment. You say, oh, you've never, you've never sinned since that moment. Sinned many times. Sinned many times. This very morning, on my face before God, asking God to forgive me because I'm not always all I ought to be. But listen, it never has caused me to doubt the fact that when he said he would save me, he has done so. There is a spiritual conversion that takes place. And then secondly, look back in chapter 1 as we recap. My recaps can turn into re-preach uh, if I'm not careful. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Not only was there a spiritual conversion, but there's also a spiritual change. In verses 6 and 7, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Hey, what's the change from walking in darkness to walking in the light? God transforms your life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The archaic is is past, and what we are, a new creature in Christ Jesus. We were created in Christ unto good works. Listen, when God made Adam and Eve, he created man in a state uh, of of, uh, uh, the ability to fellowship uh, with God. God would come down and talk with man, and that that, uh, relationship was close. Sin marred that relationship. But it's restored in the person of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You know what that means? We're made a new creature. You see the old man uh, under sin. uh, Sin separated between us and God. But that which was damaged or lost or marred in the fall is restored in Jesus Christ. And when God forgives us uh, on on the behalf of Jesus Christ, he forgives us. We are restored to fellowship 
with God. We can come back and talk to him and he talks to us. I remember writing for my senior thesis when I graduated from Bible college, oh, back in the 1600s when I went to Bible college, back in the dark ages, before television. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wrote my senior thesis on the image of God, 11,500 words. Talked about what God, what, what it meant that man was created in the image of God. And then what it meant when man fell and what was damaged, what was lost uh, of that image. Because sin corrupts everything. But praise God, what is restored in Jesus Christ. That we are uh, made again in his image through Jesus Christ. Oh listen, if, if you're genuinely saved. Not only was there a spiritual conversion, there was a spiritual change in your life. I don't mean that uh, you've never done anything wrong, but I do mean that things are different. Listen, I sinned before I got saved. I have sinned since I got saved. But I'll tell you, it's not the same. Because since I got saved, when I sin, the Holy Spirit of God convicts me. I'm sorry for my sin. My sin grieves me that it grieves God. Can I find myself a place of repentance? Oh, listen, it's, there's a change that has taken place. We don't become sinless, but we do hopefully sin less. By God's grace and God's help, there's a spiritual conversion. There's a spiritual change the life of the believer is marked by these words all come from the passage by the word by light by obedience by righteousness by sanctification by conviction and and chastening and all these things uh, there's a spiritual change and then thirdly last week we dealt with the spiritual charity there's a love for the brethren look in chapter 2 first john chapter 2 Verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> he that saith he is in the light, hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother uh, abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in, is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. You see, if you are saved, there is a love for the brethren. It's no surprise when the unsaved do not want to be around Christians because it is convicting to them. Even if you're not trying to, you know, uh, witness to them, if you're not trying to uh, pressure them, if you're not trying to do those things, there's something convicting about somebody who doesn't want to hear, the, <clears throat> doesn't want to hear the dirty jokes, doesn't want to participate in laughing at those kinds of things. Does it, does, not interested in hearing uh, about, about uh, magnifying sin or exalting sin or somehow glorifying sin. Doesn't want any part of that. There's something convicting about that. And when we find ourselves being more comfortable around God's people, uh, wanting to be around God's people, loving God's people, caring about God's people. You know, Christians, someone said one time, uh, to me, said, uh, you know, Christians are easy to take advantage of. It's true. You know why? Because we love people. We care about people. And so, as Paul said, he said, I'm willing to spend and be spent. Uh, okay. The, the, you say, well, yeah, but it, doesn't it make you a little naive? Listen, I'm not naive. I realize what's going on. But at the same time, willing rather to spend and be spent. If that's okay. If that's the cost of trying to reach people for Christ, then that's the cost of trying to reach people for Christ. <clears throat> but there is a spiritual charity. That's why the Bible talks about let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Listen, what, why is there such a bond between, Christ, between Christians? And I covered this last week. We are common sinners. We're, we're all sinners. We have a common Savior. We have a common surrender. There's a common sojourn. We're pilgrims and strangers here and then we have a common surety that christ is coming oh listen that's that's why we have uh you say well i've got nothing in common with them well listen i might not have much in common with you 
materially speaking. Amen? Uh, I've heard of churches. Um, I know of a church that when you join that church, one of the questions the pastor asks you is, do you own a gun? And if the answer is no, he says, okay, come by the house. I'll sell you one because every man in the church has to own a gun. And you say, is that real? That's, that's told to be a fact. <laughs> told to be a fact. You know, somebody once in a while say, you know, well, I, you know, I'm not a hunter, or I, or I am a hunter, or I, I'm this, or I'm that. And we might, might not have certain things in common. You might like cars. Some people don't like cars. Uh, I like loud, fast cars. I, I always, always have. I don't have any right now, but I like loud, fast cars. Uh, my wife and I, our first car we bought together was a 1970 Cutlass convertible with a Hearst four-speed on the floor, 350 Quadrajet. Amen. That was a go-fast car. <clears throat> but go-fast cars also get you lots of tickets. Amen. And uh, my first car I bought as a, before I got uh, married was a 1967 Camaro. Oh, yeah, go-fast cars. I like go-fast cars. But you might say, well, I'm not a car guy. You know what? That's okay. Because what we have in common is more important than cars, more important than hunting. Did I just say that? Uh, more important. <laughs> I know season evidently just opened yesterday, I think, but I, I didn't make it to the woods. But, uh, and so, but more important than those things. Why? Because we have a common salvation. <laughs> we have a common home in heaven. We have a common Savior. We have a common guest in our lives. The Holy Spirit we're going to talk about in just a moment. Oh, listen, it causes us to have much in common, and what matters is in common, and so that gives us a love for one another. And so then, let's talk about this morning, a spiritual companion. But before I do that, think about this. Where do you stand so far? A spiritual conversion, a time and place where you trusted Christ, a spiritual change that, 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 that listen... People might be able to see on the outside the effect of it, but the real change is in the heart. The effect of it is seen outwardly. And then a spiritual charity. Is there a sincere love for the brethren? Do you have the birthmarks <clears throat> that we've covered so far? Now let's cover one more. When a person is genuinely saved, there will be the inner witness of the Holy Spirit of God. He, the Bible says back in our text of 1 John chapter 3 and verse number, uh, excuse me, 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. When somebody gets saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. You say, well, I heard sometimes people talking about, about Christ dwelling in you is it christ that dwells in you or is it the holy spirit that dwells in you and the answer is yes if you want to get very technical and theological about it which is okay the bible describes it as the spirit of christ the spirit of christ specifically it is the third person of the godhead the holy spirit but it is Christ because it is his spirit. Because while we try to separate God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for their offices, you cannot separate them otherwise. He that hath the Son, uh, if, you, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Because they, they are one. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. We are the same. And so when you have the whole, when you're saved, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Notice with me in Romans chapter number 8. Let's get into the Bible study, the, the, the uh, Word of God. Romans chapter number 8. And verse number 16. When a person is genuinely saved, there's the witness of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16. The Spirit itself... Beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, 
some might say, well, uh, oh, I want to point out here that the first word spirit there is capitalized. The second one is not. The first one referring to the Holy Spirit. The second referring to the spirit of man. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Now, this is one of, the, one of those verses that gets, you know how, you ever had anybody say something to you like this? I've had people say this, you know what, you know, just like the Bible says, don't take any wooden nickels. You know, people get convinced that something's in the Bible. It's like, I don't know where, they, where it comes from. But sometimes, you know, a, uh, a Bible verse gets changed or uh, gets said differently. And it gets said enough that it, it, it kind of grows legs and, and it lives that way. And I've had people say, oh, yeah, yeah, that person, man, they're a good Christian. And I know, that, I know they're saved because my spirit just bears witness with their spirit. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that, we are the, that I am the Son of God. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. Uh, how do you know the first one's supposed to be capitalized and the second one's not supposed to be capitalized? Isn't that a matter of interpretation? Yes. You say, whoa, yes. Didn't expect you to say that. Well, that's because we don't understand uh, how God preserves his word. Because in, in translation, there uh, is of necessity also some interpretation. Because when the translators were translating our Bible for us, and they read this, they said, by consensus, 46 translators, they said, this is obviously the Spirit of God. And so they capitalized it to be accurate because it's a name of God, you must capitalize it. And so that's why you find the word W-O-R-D sometimes in the Bible capitalized. In John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why do you find it capitalized there? Because as they were translating, it's obvious to them, the 46 translators, that this is obviously referring to Jesus Christ, the living word. And so to be accurate in their translation, it had to be capitalized because it makes it title. And so we have in this passage the right understanding of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, original document, which was that the Holy Spirit of God bears witness with the spirit of man. Think about this. How many of you have seen Jesus Christ with your physical eyes? Yep, don't raise your hand because then we, we got a special section of church to sit you in called the cuckoo seats. And, uh, and so we haven't seen him physically with our eyes. We don't hear him physically with our ears. Where do we perceive God? In the spirit. You see, because when before you got saved, what was the condition of your spirit? Dead. You were spiritually dead. But what happened when you got saved? The Bible says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, were you already physically alive? Yes, you were. But what came alive when you got saved? You became alive spiritually. Your spirit that was dead is now alive. And that spirit is the point of contact whereby we perceive God. So the Holy Spirit, again, I know I'm, you know, in the theological weeds here, but I, I, I want you to understand why some of these things, because it's confusing to some people, some, or to all of us at some point. It's confusing till we understand that what, what's going on here is we've been made spiritually alive and we perceive the things of God from, the, from a spiritual standpoint, that's why the Bible says uh, that, uh, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Because you keep reading, it says, because they are spiritually discerned. If you are spiritually dead, you can't perceive the things of God. But when you've been quickened spiritually, now the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And that is that inner witness. When we get saved, when you got saved, if you're truly a child of God, there is a spiritual companion. He moved in. Romans chapter 8, 
Look with me in verse 9. The Bible says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, there's, remember I told you, is it Christ or is it the Holy Spirit? It's the Spirit of Christ. Okay? Notice here's the phrase, the Spirit of Christ. Uh, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is none of his. In other words, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I don't have the Holy Spirit. Then you're not saved. And so we have a spiritual companion. Uh, his job is multifaceted. Let's look at some of the things he does. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Time to do a clean out of papers in my Bible because they're getting in my way. Once the file system gets too big, it becomes a pile system in my desk. Uh, Ephesians chapter, that's a true story. <laughs> Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and look with me in verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Bible talks about... Um, Matter of fact, look back with me. Uh, let me find this real quick, and then I'll give you directions, all right? Things just pop into my head once in a while. Um, no. Nope. See, when they pop into my head, sometimes they, it's not right. <laughs> I can't find it there. Anyway, I'll find it later on the way home. That's when I find it. I'll go, oh, yeah. But the Bible talks about the fact that we are sealed. When, uh, when we got saved, uh, when we got saved, I, I just found it. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. There's nothing wrong with my mind, with my mind, with my mind, with my mind. In Ephesians chapter number 1, the Bible says in verse 12 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. One of my favorite verses. That's why I never forget where it is. <laughs> what is this verse talking about? After you heard the word of the, the gospel of grace, amen, you believed in Jesus Christ. You know what that's talking about? That's salvation. And the Bible says that uh, after, after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible talks about in John chapter number 10 that uh, he's, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's Jesus speaking. Do you agree with that? Amen? Amen. All right, because that's going to save us time looking it up. Then he goes on to say, my father which gave them me is greater than all. And nobody, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Amen? Amen. So the Bible says that, that when you get saved, he, he said, uh, if I can use this as an illustration because it's what I have in my pocket. I have a key. And he says, when you get saved, you're like that key. And you are put in God the father's hand. And nobody can get you out. Satan would have to be stronger than God to get you out of God's hand. And Jesus, uh, G, excuse me, Jesus said, G, Jesus said, I put you in my hand. You'd have to be stronger than Jesus to get you out. He said, if that's not enough for you, 
He said, my father which gave them me is greater than all. No man has they plucked them out of my father's hand. So you're in Jesus' hand, and you're also in God the Father's hand. And he said, if that's not enough for you, that the Holy Spirit of God then seals you until the day of redemption. We, ha- we, are, we are triple protected, amen? Because we're in the hand of Christ. We're in the hand of God the Father. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How long until you sin? How long until God gets tired of you? How long until you change your mind? No, until the day of redemption. Redemption is when you, when, you, when you go to redeem something, it's when you pick up something that you have purchased. You actually take possession of it. You have redeemed it. If you take something to the pawn shop, I don't recommend this. If you take your wedding band to the pawn shop, don't do that. But if you took it to the pawn shop and you left it there because you needed quick cash because there was a big sale on handguns. I'm just trying to think of a plausible situation that our men would go, hmm, I can see that. When you go back, which you better, to get that wedding ring back, and you pay it, pay for it, you are redeeming it. So you are taking possession of what is yours. Now, when you get saved, you no longer belong to you. The Bible says you are not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And until the day of redemption, what's the day of redemption? That's the day that he takes possession of me. And until that time, I am sealed. Oh, what a... What a blessing it is to understand that when you genuinely come to Christ, you have a a, a spiritual companion that moves in with you. And part of his job is he seals you. In John chapter 16. John chapter 16. What else does the Holy Spirit of God do for us? In John 16, look in verse number... Well, if I could get there. John 6, that looked a lot like 16 when I glanced at it. John 16 and verse number uh, 13. Jesus here is promising the giving of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Jesus said, said, he said, what I, he said, it is expedient for you that I go away in verse number 7. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now let me just hit the, can you hit the pause button for a minute? Yeah, some of y'all just not going to do it. You just can keep reading, aren't you? <laughs> pause. Why did Jesus say, it is expedient that I go away? Because if I go not away, the Spirit won't come. But if I go away, I'll send him to you. Why is that? I've heard all kinds of I, heard, I, I read a, an article one time, this guy s- surmised, he said, if two persons of the Godhead were ever in the same place at the same time, there'd be so much power that there'd be this, this epic cosmic explosion that would completely destroy the entire universe. I just have one thing to say to that. Be, 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 are there not two persons of the Godhead in one place right now? God the Father and God the Son. Were there not two persons of the Godhead at the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized, when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove? Sure there were. So uh, you say, well then, preacher, why did Jesus say, if, if I go not away, the Spirit will not come. But if I go away, I'll send him to you. I, I think it's as simple as this. Uh, in the plan of God's redemption of man, each of the persons of the Godhead had a responsibility. God the Father was the author of the plan of salvation. Amen? He planned it from, the Bible says, from eternity past. This was always the plan. This isn't plan B. This is, was always what he knew he would do. God the Son 
He came and he paid for redemption. That was his part. God the Father, he said, uh, the, the Bible talks about, for unto us a, son, uh, a child is born, unto us a son is given. We, ha- uh, we have uh, Jesus Christ, God the Son, dying on the cross, paying for your sin, paying for my sin. And then as our high priest, as Brother Matt has been leading us uh, through the book of Hebrews, as our high priest, there he went to the Holy of Holies, a place not made with hands, and presented his blood one time for us because that's the appropriate high priest for us, as we heard last week. You say, well, what's the Holy Spirit's job? Holy Spirit's job in this age is to convict and convince men. Notice what he says here. He says uh, in verse number seven, if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the, the prince of this world is judged. Now, let's stop there and hit the pause button again. <clears throat> because people say, I'm familiar with those verses, pastor, but I don't know what they mean. It means this, that when the Holy Spirit of God came after Jesus Christ, death, burial, and he rose again, he sent the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit's job is in the world, the first job is to convince men of their sin. Why? Uh, It says right here, of sin because they believe not on me. You know the sin that will send someone to hell? Not trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so the, it is the Holy Spirit. When you take the word of God and you're trying to witness to somebody and show them that God loves them, and, uh, but, but it starts with the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, the one that convinces them that that is true is not you. It is the Holy Spirit of God. If they really genuinely understand that they're a sinner, that's the Holy Spirit of God that is convincing them. Now, someone might agree with you, but in their mind say, eh, I'm not really that bad. But listen, they are, when that happens, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Spirit of God because it's his job to, to reveal to them that they are sinners. So of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. You say, well, preacher, what's that mean? It means there is a standard of holiness and righteousness, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. The proof of his holiness The proof of his perfection is the fact that God the Father accepted his sacrifice for our sins as the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So what's the Holy Spirit say? The Holy Spirit says to a lost man, you need to trust Jesus Christ. Why Jesus Christ? Because he is righteousness. And then of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. You say, what's that got to do with the lost man? Because the prince of this world is not the only one going to be judged. He's simply saying there is a judgment coming. Listen, this is a good three-point outline. Because it's what the Holy Spirit, I know we usually say, you know, four things you need to know to be saved. (laughs) But really it boils down to these three things. You're lost because of your sin. Jesus Christ is the only hope of salvation because he alone is righteous. And then number three, there's judgment to come if you do not trust Jesus Christ. Oh, listen, you say, well, what's that got to do with us? That's that's the world. Yes, but keep reading. He says in verse 12, I have many, have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit of God, once we get saved, he becomes our teacher. He becomes our guide. You know, I was talking to a pastor this week. I was talking to a pastor about the issues about the Bible. And he said, but preacher, what do we do when we come up against these kinds of questions or areas that there really is no answer for. I said, oh, that's simple. He said, well, if it's simple, I can't see it. I said, oh, that's the, most, that's the easiest part. He goes, how can it be the easiest part? I said, because 
That's where faith comes in. What God has not declared unto us, we simply trust him with. And so, oh, listen, uh, come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give, give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. Oh, what a blessed truth it is that we can have hope in Jesus Christ. We trust him. We, we, we can believe and, and depend on him. And the Holy Spirit, one of the things he does in the life of the believer, not only does he seal us, not only is he that inner witness, but he also directs us or leads us. He gives us assurance. We've covered that uh, in some measure, so I'm not going to go into it much now, but the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. There's other verses we could go to, but we don't. Uh, I think we've covered that. The presence of, of the Spirit of God in our lives is proof positive that we belong to the Lord. The presence of the Holy Spirit of God in your life is proof positive. Why? Because the Bible said if you, have the, if you belong to him, you have the Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to him. You say, well, preacher, that just, that, that answers the question, but it brings up another. How do you know when, the, when you have the Holy Spirit? You're, you're right, that it does bring up another. I can tell you this, I can tell you when the Holy Spirit of God is present in your life, he does these things. He speaks to you. He'll tell you things. He guides you. He warns you. He leads you. He'll feed you. He comforts you. He will teach you the truth. He, he, uh, he becomes a reality in your heart when you are adopted into the family of God like a mother uh, who, who secures an insecure child uh, to comfort them and, and come alongside them. In other words, when you get saved... There is a spiritual instinct placed in you that immediately uh, begins. To, and by the way, that's when you start loving the brethren as well as we talked about last week. But you say, well, preacher, but isn't, isn't that very subjective? It is subjective. But I'm going to try to give a little bit of clarity. Because if there is no, never any peace, if there's never any assurance... If there's never any uh, fellowship with God, if there is no love of the brethren, these are all things the Holy Spirit of God does in you. Oh yeah, listen, go study in, in Peter where it says, the fruit of the Spirit is. Because those things are, when it says the fruit of the Spirit, it means it's what he produces in you. It is not the Christian going, well, you know, I'm supposed to love, joy, peace. Okay, I'm supposed to have peace. So I really need to work on peace this week. Okay, and I'll talk myself into peace. You know, oh, oh, oh. No, if we're not careful, we try to, we try to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our strength. When it's the fruit of the Spirit. You can't lather it up by your own effort. You know, these, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, natural soap. I'm trying to get natural sometimes, you know, get lather out of natural soap. It just doesn't want to lather like, like that cheap store-bought stuff that they put all the additives in that are going to, you know, kill you probably, you know. But it, sure, lather is nice, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so we're not careful. We try to Lather up, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. We try to make ourselves, talk ourselves into it. And it's not about that. It's what he produces in you. Say, yes, but preacher, it's still subjective. How does he do it? How do I know it's him? I don't know if the Spirit of God is there. I don't know if it's just me. And it is a question because... You can get a false sense of peace. I've talked to lots of people that say, look, I know this is, I know the Bible says don't do this, but I've prayed about it and I have peace. Well, where's that peace come from? 
Jesus said, I'm going to give you my peace, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The world can give you a false sense of peace. So I'm going to give you as much help this morning as I can that it's, it, feels like, it feels like it took years for God to work in my mind to be able to synthesize this into something you can give to somebody else and maybe make it usable. And that is this, that the Bible is called the sword of the spirit. So the Holy Spirit, he comes and he shows sinners that they're lost. How does he do that? By a feeling? No, by the revelation of the word of God. Because Romans chapter 10, verses 10 and 13, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because the Bible declares, if you've broken one commandment, you're guilty of all. The Holy Spirit brings conviction in the heart of a lost man by the word of God. He shows us that Christ is the righteousness of God. How does he do that? By a feeling? By a sign in the stars? No, by the declaration of the word of God. This is his sword. And he shows us that there is a judgment coming. There's an ultimate judgment at the end of all ages called the lake of fire. How does he know? How does, how does he instruct us in that? Through some seance or Ouija board? No, through the word of God. So I just take this conclusion that what the Holy Spirit of God does, he does through his word. You say, how does that apply to our present question, Pastor? Thank you for asking such an intelligent question. I believe it works this way. That when I read or hear God's word, the Holy Spirit of God works in my heart through that word. And that word will either bring me comfort or conviction. And you can preach it. I can be, I'm preaching it today. And it can be bringing some comfort and some conviction. What's the difference? The difference is how the Holy Spirit of God is using his word in the individual heart. Isn't that what he came to do? So it is as complicated and as simple as this. When I hear God's word or I read God's word, when it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that brings me great comfort. For somebody who's not saved, it would bring conviction. And so it is as simple and as complex as this. What, how does God, how does the Spirit of God use the Word of God in your heart? Because He's speaking to you. He's either speaking to you that, you need, that you're not generally born again, or He's speaking to you that you, you are. You say, well, yeah, but there, He convicts me of my sin. Okay, He does that too. He does that too. You see, because if I'm saved, I'm a child of God, he doesn't, he doesn't just leave me, go do what I want to do. He chastens me. He works on me. He convicts me so that I will confess my sin again to God, the sins that I commit on a daily basis. You say, well, how does this finally relate? Because you remember that passage of Scripture that talks about uh, the peace of God that passes all understanding. You say, well, can you explain it to me, preacher? I'm saying God gives me a peace that is beyond my ability to fully translate for you. But the word of God, the Holy Spirit of God uses it to comfort me that I am a child of God. To convict me when I'm wrong and I'm not doing what I should. That's, that's the answer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's how you say, well, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? Listen, if you're, if you're getting peace about something you know the Bible says don't do, that cannot be the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Cannot be the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I'm getting peace about it. Yeah. But it's not God's peace. God's peace is always going to agree with the word of God. Why? Because this is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. He's not going to use something other than the Bible. He's going to use the Bible. 
People say today, well, preacher, just, just talk to me from the pulpit about the love of God. But please don't use the Bible. Please don't beat me up with the Bible. Please don't hit me over the head with the Bible. Listen, what do I have to say that's worth anything? What God has to say is the only thing that matters. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you don't even want me to be the one that you stand before later on. You stand before God. I'm saying this to you. If you genuinely are saved, you have the birthmarks of the true believer. You have a spiritual conversion as a time when you trusted Christ. You have a spiritual change, and you know that in your heart that you look at things differently. You view things, the same things, you view them differently now. You have a spiritual charity, the love of the brethren, and a spiritual companion, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you can quench the Holy Spirit. You can try to ignore the Holy Spirit. You can sear your conscience to where you don't, where his voice is not as loud as it needs to be. You can do that. You can get to the place where you feel comfortable just doing what you want to do. But when that happens, the Bible says there's destruction of the flesh. If we will not listen to God, if we are of no use to him here, you say, well, I know somebody who claims to be a Christian, but they're not, they don't live like a Christian at all, and blah, 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 blah. You say, what about them? I don't know about them. It's not my job to know about them. We get forced into, we let people force us into, as Christians, uh, to get into things that aren't our business. Whether or not that another person is saved or not, I, I don't know that. I, are, well, are they really not saved? I don't know. Are they just backslidden? I don't know. Again, I don't know. What do I know? I know I'm a child of God. The Spirit bears witness with my spirit that we are the sons of God. I hope and pray that you recognize in your life the birthmarks of a true believer, of a genuine Christian. But I also hope that if you recognize that these birthmarks are not there, that you will come to Christ and trust him as your Savior. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, for a, a moment of invitation, where are you? This is not for you to judge anybody else by or look at anybody else's life by or I know a guy that. No, it's not for any of that. It's for you and me to determine our own standing before God. And I wonder today if you'd say, Pastor Wagon Shoots, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not perfect. I'm not where I ought to be totally. But there is no doubt in my mind, there's no doubt in my heart that I am a child of God. The Holy Spirit, is He confirms it with me. He uses the Word of God and, and brings me such comfort concerning my eternal destiny. I rejoice when I think about Christ's coming all the things that await me because of Jesus Christ, and he confirms it in me. I know, I know what I got saved. I, I, I know the change that took place, and I, I know that I'm saved. With no one else looking around, if you just give testimony of that by just putting your hand up quietly and just holding it there for a moment, I know that I'm saved. There's no doubt in my mind. Just slip your hand up and just hold it there. I know that I'm saved. All right, you can put your hands back down. I wonder if somebody might say, Pastor Waggett shoots. I didn't know before today, but I know now that I am not saved. I know that I've never trusted Jesus Christ. There's never been a change in my life. And I'm concerned about eternity. Would you pray for me? And I will. But you must request it. I have to know. And you say, Pastor Wagner Shoots, I know I'm not saved. I'm concerned about it. Now, if you're not concerned, don't bother raising your hand. I can't do anything for you. I can't save you. But if you say, Pastor Wagner Shoots, I'm lost. I'm not saved. I'm concerned about it. Would you pray for me? I will pray for you. Just slip your hand up and write back down. Yes. Okay, you put it right back down. Anybody else? Pastor Wagner Shoots, I'm not saved. Can you pray for me? Father, I pray for these that raise their hand. Thank you, first of all, that uh, 
many have trusted Christ. Lord, I do pray for uh, one that, that uh, says he knows he's not saved. Lord, I pray for others that maybe didn't raise their hand. Sometimes people are afraid. But I pray that more than anything, we'd want to know that our soul is secure, that we are a child of God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us then to uh, come to Christ and know Christ as our personal Savior. And Lord, I thank you for the assurance that we have. And I pray that for those that raise their hand that they're saved, I pray that they would have not only that assurance, but the constant presence of the Holy Spirit directing them into a life of sanctification and holiness. And God, that you might help uh, us to be submissive to that. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed, please, again, this invitation is a very private, personal time.